Welcome to Holman United Methodist Church, where our vision is to be a place where bells are rung as we gather for dynamic worship, grow through inspired learning, and go into joyful service to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our mission is to fulfill the Great Commission by inviting people into discipleship with Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Safe and secure child care is available for children five years and under. Please take your little ones to the nursery now through the, through the rear entrance of the sanctuary. An usher or security guard can direct you. Please rise as you are able to join me in our call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd. I will fear no evil. We will love one another as Christ loved us. Christ, the good shepherd, has compassion for all. We will love one another as Christ loved us. Open your hearts to goodness and mercy today. We will love one another as Christ loves us. Love not merely in thought and word, but in truth and action. We will love one another as Christ loved us. Before we take our seats, let us join the jubilant voices of Holman in praise and worship, singing I Love You Lord Today by William F. Hubbard, sung by Jeff Robinson. the jubilant voices minister to us again, singing Fred Hammond's arrangement of Love's in Need by Stevie Wonder. Inside his heart will bring 
Your tenderness can heal a heart that's broken, scarred, and torn apart. Somebody needs to feel how much you really gain. Yeah, yeah. No longer can we pretend we don't need love or a true friend. Cause it wasn't meant to be this way. Yesterday's gone, but we can get down on our knees today and say no. I was waiting for that part to go in, uh, uh, bring it down a little. Love is very peaceful, so bring it down a little. Hey, hey, hey. Then he did this. Y'all showed him some love. Uh, stand before you to uh, lead us in corporate prayer. In your bulletins, you'll see the names of those that we are remembering in prayer today. Gwinnett, Gwinnett Parker. Ilana Bailey Williams, James Bailey, Helen Harris, Lorene Flanagan, Leonard White, Dr. Harold Jordan, Larry Turner, Dr. Barbara Lake, the people of Los Angeles, of Haiti, Gaza, Rwanda, and the Ukraine. They're undoubtedly people that we have not put on this list that you would like us to pray for today. And in our custom, as long as I've been here, we just lift those names up audibly right now. So just say the names or the situations that you'd like prayer for today now. God who is love, 
God who is called love, we need you today. For those that we have put into the atmosphere audibly and for all those people and situations that we did not name, we know that you see, you sit high and look low that you are among us and that you care for us. So we cast these cares on you, um, asking for you to be who you are, the healer, the deliverer, the peacemaker, the lover, the keeper. And when we run out of the words to say and, and the accuracy of how to pray them, we return to what Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Her kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The jubilant voices now continue their ministry of music with More Than Anything, written by Lamar Campbell, following the selection. Yeah. <laughs> Sung by Myron, soloist Myron Jackson. Richard. That's what I thought, but I, I got it out of order. Sorry. It's out of order today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. The scripture reading for today it's from, and will be found in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, and 13b. 1 through 8a, I should say, and 13b. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mystery and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now the jubilant voices will continue in their ministry of music with more than anything written by Lamar Campbell. Following the selection, Pastor Christian Washington will deliver the message, love is not envious. And our soloist is Myron Jackson. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. 
Father. You reign on the throne. No one but you. For you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. gone. I can sing to you this song. I just want, I just want to say that I
I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Almighty God. Said I, I love you. I love you all my life, all myself, all my strength, oh, all Jesus. that I am. Him all the time. Just want to tell you, tell him. Lord, I love you. some places in this country right now where we'd be saying hallelujah. hallelujah giving God the highest praise y'all show some love for this wonderful jubilant voices Robert and RJ ah, for all that serve us today repeat after me I am significant because God says so I am significant and I was created to do significant things. Now find somebody else in the room and tell them you are significant. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Look them in the eye and tell them you are significant. Because God says so. You are significant. And you were created to do significant things. And as the body of Christ and Holman United Methodist Church, we say we are significant because God says so. We are significant and we were created to do significant things. Now clap your hands, oh ye people, for significant things. You know, every now and then a song gets stuck in your head and you can't get it out. And I, all this week, as I've been preparing for this message, this one song would not let me go. Y'all know me. I got to let you know. Gotta, it, it's, it was, it's a song by um, a psalmist named William Devon. He grew up in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and this song became a huge hit. M most would call William Devon a one-hit wonder. Hit, but he had one show enough hit. And it was a, it, it was a song all about gratefulness, being grateful. It, it, it went a little bit like this. It went, um, though you may not drive, a great big Cadillac. I'm talking about one with gangster white walls and a TV antenna in the back. You, you may not have a car at all, but remember, brothers and sisters, you can still stand tall. Here it comes. Just be thankful for what you got. Diamond in the back, sunroof top, digging the scene with a... <laughs> oh my gosh, I've, I've hit some, I've hit an era here that many of y'all lived in and are right now saying, yeah, 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 that, that's for me. You may not have a car at all, but remember, brothers and sisters, Doom, doom, doom. You can still stand tall. What you gonna do? Just be thankful. Doom, 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 doom. Oh, what you got? 
Can we take it to the bridge? Can we take it to the bridge? Diamond in the back. Sounds so nice. You got to say it twice. Say it. Diamond in the back. Sunroof top. Dig in the scene with a. <laughs> now, what I saw in the audience was some of y'all remember when uh, power steering first came out, it wasn't so power. So when you've taken that gang Celine, I saw some folk taking that long. It took this long just to turn. Y'all had that whole. And, and you lean with it. I don't know if that's just an L.A. thing, but we, we lean with it. If I had a different, if I, I, know, I know this message is love is, but if I had another uh, uh, way of talking about it, I probably would have named it just be thankful for what you got. Or, or as my mother would say, um, just be uh, extremely grateful for what you have. <laughs> then we run outside and go, be, grand, be thankful for what you got. But you got. Paul's <laughs> talking to some folks who are actually the opposite of thankful. We're still in 1 Corinthians 13. We're still talking about this love and what love is. And we, we talked last week about what love is. Love is patient. We went there. We talked before that about love being agape, this selfless choice that we make. And patience last week, suffering, deciding to suffer, choosing to suffer a little bit so I can be free forever. But today we, we get to where Paul takes a turn and says, let me now tell you what love is not. And it's interesting that he starts with love is not envious, envious. Good translation there. The, the, the word for envy there is actually the same root word for where we get zeal or zealous. Zeal or zealous, which is love or adoration turned into obsession, right? In this case, this, this is a, the, that's the root word, but when you build it out to what's said here by Paul, he's saying that this is the love of something that turns negative. This is coveting. This is getting to a place where you actually act badly with your love. Let me see if I can make this, make this more clear. Um, the people there that he's speaking to had started to divide into factions. He was talking to an adolescent church that actually started basically denominations. I mean, it started off with Peter, Peter being the first pope. They, they wanted a pontiff. So there were some people who wanted to follow Peter, be more Jewish, be more in the, in the stream of people who'd been with Jesus and, and sat with Jesus. And, and so they wanted a pope. So they, they, they looked at Peter as the one they'd follow. Others said, no, 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 we need a prophet. And they loved Paul. Paul was not that, the most uh, good-looking guy by, by, by legend. Paul was not necessarily the most uh, eloquent guy in his oratory. Paul was obviously a phenomenal writer and very learned, but Paul was that fire and brimstone, I'm going to tell you straight, no chaser, I'm going to preach you Jesus and Jesus, Jesus crucified, I'm going to be a man in a man's spot doing man things, that's what Paul was, he was the prophet. Ah, but then others, they wanted to follow the preacher. See, Apollos showed up, and Apollos, you know, he had a Bentley and a plane. Apollos was polished. Apollos was eloquent. Apollos was that one telling you, if you, you can talk about your pie in the sky when you die, but you want to have your pie now. Apollos had a little bit of that Reverend Ike in it. <laughs> Fried, died, laid to the side. Fried. Apollos was the preacher, pope, prophet, preacher. Then you had this new group that was coming up that I'd like to call the Pentecostals. Because they didn't want any of that. They just wanted Jesus. They just wanted the Spirit. And the crazy thing about the whole thing that Paul is dealing with is that all four of them were fighting each other and telling each other that they're wrong. Oh, the Pope is telling the prophet, you're wrong because you're hanging out with too many of those Gentiles. Prophet is telling the preacher, you're wrong because you're doing all that prosperity stuff. And you're just trying to make people feel good and follow you and look good. Uh, the, prophet, the prophet also had something to say about those spirit people over there. You spirit people are wrong because y'all are taking too long <laughs> to have your services. 
and you're letting women do too many things. Huh? Uh, the preacher just said, I don't care as long as they give me their money. The spirit people say, you're all wrong. Your services are too short. Because the spirit can't show up in 45 minutes. The spirit can't show up in an hour. The spirit can't show up quiet. We want to be in the, lay in the spirit for hours. We want to just be in the spirit. All we want is Jesus. All we, all we want is the spirit. We want to we take our time and lay in it and be in it. They all are saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And the world they're trying to reach is watching this whole thing and saying, if that's what it is, I don't want any of that. If that's how y'all act, y'all are worse than us. I might as well stay out here in Corinth and have a good time because Corinth was Vegas. So I might as well do Vegas things because what y'all are doing is some mess. Paul's writing into this. He tells them love is patient, love is kind. But then he says, tells them love does not envy. Love's not envious. See, what they look like to me is what my mother used to call crabs in a bucket. Crabs in a bucket. Anybody know anything about crabbing? If you do, some of y'all Texas folks, some of y'all Louisiana folks, y'all know what I'm talking about. The, the, if you put a whole mess of crabs in a bucket, you can leave it there and not worry about any of them getting out. Because instinctively, if one tries to get out, the others will pull it back in. If one tries to rise, the others will say, no, 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 you need to be right back here where we are. They'll grab you by that paw, grab you by that pincher, grab you by that leg and pull you back down into the same level as everybody else. See, these people didn't care about who they weren't reaching. They didn't care about what was going on in the community. They didn't care about all the people whose needs weren't being served. All they cared about was being right in their church and being with folk who were right in their church. And in that, in that, they're saying, hey, you can have your denomination, you can have yours, you can have yours, but none of us are getting out of right here. Crabs in a bucket. Paul says to them, love is not the thing that causes this crabs in a bucket mentality. Love is not envious. But let me draw a distinction here because many times that's also translated as love is not jealous. And, and I, I'd offer you that, that, that I think that that definition is not quite it, which is why I think the one that's in our, in our version today is accurate. Because jealousy is not the same as envy. See, jealousy uh, looks a whole like, a lot like me on a Christmas morning when I was a kid. That Christmas when I fully expected to get a bike. I'm talking about a 10 speed. I went to bed that night fighting sleep, you know, fighting, wanting to see what was going to come down my chimney. Now, we didn't have a chimney. That's all right. I just knew that I'd wake up to a 10 speed. I was ready for it. When I finally fell asleep, I, I got up that next morning and I ran downstairs. Okay, we had a two-bedroom house, <laughs> so, so I didn't run downstairs. It just sounds better when I say I ran downstairs <laughs> tell the truth shame the devil <laughs> as a younger preacher I would have said I ran downstairs but now I'm transparent <laughs> there was no stairs there's no chimney <laughs> as I went from my room to the front room <laughs> some people know the front room right I went to the front room <laughs> and uh and I looked under the tree and there's no bike what they got me clothes <laughs> so you don't know what it feels like to wake up looking for a bike and get some clothes later to find out they used to be your cousin clothes <laughs> all right buddy you look really good in those new clothes go outside and play and I get outside, and all I see is woo, woo, woo. Big wheel, woo, woo, ten speed, woo, woo, stink, woo. And here I am in my clothes. 
See, what jealousy is in a, in a sentence is, I want what you have. I wanted those bikes. I really did. I wanted a bike. I would have traded all my clothes for a bike. I would have taken a one speed. Just give me a bike. Jealousy is I want what you have. Envy takes it to another level. Ah, the, the Greeks had a, a goddess they called Invidia. Uh, and Invidia was this goddess who was desperately jealous of the gods, the godhead, the gods in Olympus, and everything that they did, and wanted to just spoil everything they did. It is said that she lived in this high place in a cave and was constantly being bitten in the heart by vipers, poisonous vipers. It, it filled her entire bloodstream with, with venom and, and poison, and she'd go out and find anything beautiful that the gods would create, scratch it, and kill it from inside. Kill anything beautiful. Kill anything the gods created. Kill anything they did. Kill everything they did. That was NVIDIA. That's where we get the word envy from. See, envy is not just, I want what you have. It's, I hate that you have it. It's I hate you for having it. Envy's another level. Envy's scarcity. Envy's a zero-sum game. Envy is me going outside in my clothes and finding a vulnerable little kid on a 10-speed, knocking that kid off the 10-speed, and taking the 10-speed, thinking his parents would say, well, my kid's injured, but he might as well take the 10-speed. Envy is I not only want what you have, I hate that you have it, and I hate you for having it. That will keep crabs in a barrel. You, you get near the top, you're Harriet Tubman crab, about to get out, and snitch crab grabs you by the talon, grabs you by the leg, and pulls you back in. Because I can't let you get out. I hate the idea that if you getting out, I hate you for even trying to get out. That's envy. Are y'all getting this? Are you seeing the distinction? Paul is talking to something very, very serious here. This is the opposite of love. This is, this is like the, the mirror image on the, on the wrong side of love. This is love gone way, way Wrong. Ah, jealousy. Envy. You know, it's, it occurs to me, though, that there's a twist in this metaphor that i got to hit you with. See, I talked about crabs in a barrel, but let me talk about crabs for just a moment. If, if crabs is a metaphor for us, crabs is a metaphor for these people in Corinth, crabs have a unique ability. It's called autotomy, A-U-T-O-T-O-M-Y, autotomy. And autotomy is the ability to lose a limb and grow it back. Autotomy says that you can take my pincher or my leg in a stressful situation and within about a year, it will not only grow back, it will grow back stronger. Now, autotomy is a reflex. It's not something that, 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 that we know a crab is thinking. But what it is is a defense mechanism. It's a reflex. When a threat is presented and a crab has no other choice, it automatically, by reflex, lets that thing go that they're grabbing onto and gets away quickly. Uh, a year later, that thing is back, and it's stronger than the one they left. Now, you might be thinking, and as I was thinking, as I'm thinking about the whole metaphor, if they can do that, if a crab can get rid of and let go of a, a, a limb and grow it back, why don't they just do that and get out of the, the bucket? Then am, am I the only one who thinks like this? If I, can, if I can get rid of this leg and take that leg and I can get out into freedom, then take the leg. <laughs> why? Ah, let me give you at least two reasons why. The first reason why is that because autonomy happens 
in the face of a threat, they don't perceive other crabs as a threat. Ah. See, when, when the threat looks like you, everything in the bucket looks the same, y'all. Everything in the bucket's the same race, the same creed, the same place. They come from the same place, the same species. Everything looks like one that you can trust. They look like your family. They look like your church. They look like your people. They look like your people. They're people that you should be able to trust, the people you love the most, the people that love you the most. Your mama's in there. Your daddy's in there. Your cousin's in there. Your, your tribe is in there. Your frat's in there. Your sorority's in there. They look like folk you should trust so they don't let go because they don't perceive the threat. They don't recognize the threat. Corollary to that is that if you don't recognize the threat, then the instinct or the reflex never kicks in to let something go. It's, and, and what happens is you end up having the, the opposite mentality. You think that these things are essential. You think these things are irreplaceable. You're going through life thinking all these things I have are essentials. All these people around me that are part of my circle are essentials. All these things I've acquired are irreplaceable. Ah. <sighs> See, if you think everything's irreplaceable, if you think this is something that you can't let go of, and you don't think the people around you are a threat, then when you get pulled back into that bucket, it's because you didn't let go. Some of y'all already know where I'm going. Ah, envy is I want what you have and I don't want you to have it. Envy says if you have it, I can't. Envy says there's only so much pie. Here is the first part of the pie for six foot one, dark skin, African American, educated males with bald heads and nice suits. <laughs> and if you take that piece, I will never get a piece. Envy takes me to the place where I make sure you don't take my piece. Somebody knows somebody like this. Somebody's connected to people like this. They live in scarcity. So how do you break through this? How do you get out of these situations? How do you get out of the bucket? What was Paul basically trying to tell them? I got five R's for you. If, you, if you're taking notes, five R's for you. The first one is you need to recognize your predicament. What does that mean? That means you need to call a threat, a threat whether they look like you or not. Ah, whether they're your race, whether they're your ace, <laughs> whether they're your Sara, your San, huh? Whether they're your frat, cousin, uncle, auntie, Maran, Paran. I don't care. Call a threat a threat. Say it. Call a threat a threat. You've got to recognize the threat. Recognize the predicament that you're in and that some of your threats look like you. Some of your threats are people you love. Some of your threats are things that you love to do. Some of your threats are places that you love to be and circles that you love to be in and you think love you being in them. Some of your threats look like you. Recognize the threat, one. Two, repent of your part. There is this thing called enabling. There is this thing called codependency. There are some folks who have the uh, survivor's remorse. I can't leave my bucket because I feel so bad about leaving my bucket behind. I'm the first one to break out of the bucket. And he never stopped reminding me of that and making me feel bad about it. Oh, buddy, you speak too properly. Yeah. 
who do you think you are? Just because you fill in the blank doesn't make you something. And we take that and we acquiesce to it. We have to repent. We have to change our mind, change our attitude, change our, our response to when that stuff comes, when the pulls come. We have, to, we have to repent and change our attitude about acquiescing, about keeping it real, about staying down or whatever you want to call it. Anybody hear me? Anybody hearing me out here? I'm going to go preach this in the Baptist church and they're going to run around this place. <laughs> Say recognize. recognize. Say repent. repent. Uh, by the way, repent is also maybe for somebody who is the crab pulling folk down. I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I'm asking you to. I'm asking you how you feel when people around you rise. How do you feel when people in your family do well and excel and have favor? Do you cheer them on? Or do you try to remind everybody that they ain't all that? When your ex, when your ex moves on, <laughs> I'm gonna let that go. <laughs> I'm gonna let that one go. <laughs> recognize, say recognize. Say repent. The next one is resolve. Say resolve. resolve. You got to make up in your mind, I'm getting out of this darn bucket. You got to make up in your mind, I'm moving. I've seen enough. I'm leaving you for me. I wish I'd come up with that, but that's confunction. <laughs> Somebody over here got it. I, I'm, I'm making a decision to leave, to move, to change, to grow, to enroll, to, to, to get out of. I'm making a decision. I'm resolving I'm going to leave. And I'm telling you, it's that resolution that leads to you finally taking the step or taking the climb up. Here is the thing you need to know, though. As soon as you resolve to leave, as soon as you resolve to change, to grow, to relinquish, to get out of that stuff, that is the moment when you start to climb, folk will start to reach to bring you back. Long as you're not climbing, nobody's reaching. Long as you're not climbing, nobody's clawing. You might get a little shadow boxing every now and then, a little play fight, a little slap fight, a little Muay Thai. You might get a little something, something every now and then. But that's not real. That's just us doing crab things in the crab bear bucket. That's what we do. We, we just do it living that crab life. But try to pull, it, pull yourself out. Resolve to make that move. Take that first step. Go up and get up near the top and watch what happens and watch who happens and watch what they do. Oh, it's not enough just to, to recognize and repent and resolve. The fourth is you got to relinquish the false essentials. I always think in terms of that crab who finally gets it. And a crab climbs up, fights over, gets on the side, pushes up a little bit with one claw, gets that pincher up there with that second claw, gets all the way near the top, and then they start clawing at him, and he says, just take that with you. Yeah, take that. Yeah, maybe you can see it better up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like, ah, take that. Ha, ah, take that. I'm relinquishing what you take hold of. I'm relinquishing, relinquishing this because this is a false essential. I don't need your adoration. Take it. I don't need your money. Take it. So what? You bought a pair of shoes. That don't mean you, I own you. I give them back just to be through with you. You a bugaboo. Let it go. It's false essential. You think it's irreplaceable, but you don't know about me. I can have another one of these in a minute. 
you've got to relinquish or let go of the false essential. Sometimes that's that person. I don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> now I know who I'm talking to. And maybe a few more people online, what have you. But you've got to let go of being the savior of your family. That's Jesus' job. That is Jesus' job. That is not your job. And the battle scars you have, show it. The, 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 the net worth you have and what you could have had, show it. All the times when you've been the one to show up and show out on behalf of somebody who could care less about you until that moment, false essential. I don't know. I don't. Hey, I know this is a word. I know this is a word. Ah, you have to relinquish the false essentials. Just say, let it go. Let, I, let it go. You got to let it go. Let them. Hey, look, here's the thing. When you relinquish that false es essential, it's going to feel like a death. It just will. You're going to feel like, I don't know how I live without that person. I don't know how I live without that adoration that I get. I don't know how I live without this uh, ability to be better than everybody else when I'm around. I don't know how I'm going to live without them taking care of this or taking care of this bill or taking care of this thing. Sure, they beat me like crazy, but they take care of the bills. False, essential. If that's what it takes to get the bills paid, baby, get out that bucket, give him that. Give him that arm, give him that limb, it will grow back. But it'll, it feels like a death. It feels like you lost something when you, when you let go of that thing. It feels like you lost something, but the last R is not only do we, re, we have to recognize and, and we have to repent and we have to relinquish, I'm sorry, we have to, we have to uh, oh. Resolve, relinquish. The last thing we need to do is understand that we will resurrect. Oh, we're in the fourth Sunday of Easter. And I'm telling you, resurrection is something that continues in the time right after Easter. And we are in it right now. The resurrection comes because in autonomy, what you let go of will grow back in about a year. And it'll grow back stronger. What if you knew that if you let go of something here, a year later you'll be something else, something stronger, something more resilient, something wiser? What if you knew that if you let go of something back here, that what would come back would be something not the same, but better than what you left behind? What if you knew that you're one year from being better, stronger, taller, greater than you are right now? What if you knew that you're one year and one decision away from being more significant? You let it go. You take the pain you choose to suffer now so you can be free forever. Paul is building right on top of things. He's building these concepts one after another. He's saying the same things in the same, in different ways, but he's coming back to the same place. This is about love. And it's about showing love and being love. But it's also about moving yourself away from places where love doesn't live. We recognize the threat. We repent of our part. We resolve to move, to change, to leave. We relinquish the false essentials. And then we have faith and look forward to the resurrection of our bodies and souls better than what we left. Love is not envious, but envy will kill a church. It was killing Corinth. It'll kill us if we let it. But we ain't going to let it. 
Somebody today knows of and now is clear about a false essential in their life. And today's the day you're going to let it go. And we're here as your church family to ride it out with you. We know it won't be easy. We know you'll need support. We know you need prayer. And we'll start doing that today. Let's pray. God, for these who are finding themselves in predicaments, as we all do, thank you for new eyes to see. Thank you for the ability to let go and relinquish our false essentials. Thank you, Lord, for resurrection power, the power that will take us from where we've been and who we've been to a stronger, more resilient, more significant place. Now, God, I, I now lift up those in this room, those who are hearing us online, those who are part of our, our church, who are in need of a relinquishment right now. And God, I thank, I praise you and I, and I ask you to give them the strength, the courage, give them the wherewithal to make the sacrifice, to make the sacrifice so that they might be all that you called them to be. Thank you for this word that liberates. It is this truth that makes us free. We suffer a little while, but you make us free indeed. For that, we are eternally grateful. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There are various ways you can respond to a message like this. Um, the first is one that we'd offer to you, and that is the opening of this church, the opening of this church doors. Uh, you don't have a church home, we'd love to be your church home and invite you to join us. We've been seeing a wonderful influx of people who are former members and children of former members and grandchildren of former members and great-grandchildren of former members finding their way back here on Sundays, finding their way back here on Wednesdays. Uh, you're invited to be part of our covenant relationship, but also know that we're here to walk with you, to walk through this period and this season with you. You're invited to, to be part of our home and family. Uh, in your bulletin, there is a QR code you can scan. Um, I'm not sure if we have cards. Are there cards in the, uh, in the pews? No cards? Okay. There's, there'll be cards in the back when, you, when you're going out. If you, if you want to become a member, you can fill out one of those cards. We'll be right in touch, in touch with you right away. If you want to talk about your relationship with Jesus uh, or what a relationship with Jesus might look like, or how to enhance your relationship with Jesus. We have pastors who want to talk to you, want to meet with you, make, will make time for you. And that same card on the same QR code, you can request a meeting with a pastor and we'll be right back to you really quickly. We want to hear from you and be in this race and this walk with you. Finally, there may be some of you who are saying, I need some prayer. Pastor, I, can, you, can you pray for me right now? I, 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 I saw the person while you were preaching. I saw the circumstance while you were preaching. I saw my false essentials flash before my face, and I need to let them go. But can you pray for me before I get outside and uh, shoot somebody? This altar is open for you to come and get in a posture of surrender. Going on your knees is saying, God, you are high. I am low compared to you. You have all power. And right now I feel powerless, but I know that your power can save me, can hold me, can, can help me here. That's what the altar rail is for. And you're welcome to come to it. If you do, if you have your hands face down, that means that you're just having a moment for yourself. If you put your palms up, then one of our prayer workers will come and pray with you. The doors of this church are open. The altar here is open as well. You're invited to come now.
stand here in the name of Jesus coming against that crab spirit. Coming against anything that would cause us to pull each other down anything that would get us into a place of envy that causes us to covet what someone has so much that we'd hurt them to get it. I come against that now and I take the love, the agape love that you have shown us and I pour it over. I pour it over all of this place and all this space to crowd out the crab to crowd out the envy, to crowd out the jealousy, to crowd out those who would be threats that look like us. Now, God, in this place that is clear, this place that is clean, I pray, God, that we are now those who would rise up I pray a spirit of rising, a spirit of freedom, a spirit of liberation, a, a spirit of relinquishment. I, I pray a spirit that would actually unction us to go higher for your glory so that we might not be those who are just called successful, but we are those that you would call significant. It's in the name of the most significant one, the name of Jesus, that I do pray. Amen. And amen. And here we are into our stewardship moment. During this moment in our service, we receive offerings. I invite you to consider all the ways of giving. You might drop off your envelope. As you leave the sanctuary, make a secure donation online with Givelify or Vanco. Scan the QR code on the back of your worship bulletin or send a check to the address, to the address listed on the front of the bulletin. Have you sponsored a radio broadcast? to share the message with those who are sick, shut in, or far away. Think about adorning the altar with a spray of flowers to celebrate an occasion or honor a loved one. To order flowers or sponsor a radio broadcast, visit the Holman website or contact Holman at holmanumc.com. There are many avenues of giving. Prayerfully consider them and let your heart lead you to the the offering that is best honors your relationship with God. We thank you for your continued generosity in support of the mission and vision of Holman United Methodist Church. Announcements. Our worship bulletin announcements of events, services, and opportunities here at Holman and in the community you can find the children's Sunday school lesson and schedule of weekly meetings in the bulletin. Today, I would like to highlight the following. Wednesday night continues this Wednesday, April 24th. Wednesday night live, excuse me, continues this Wednesday, April 24th. Come to White Hall at 6.30 p.m. for refreshments, followed by Pastor Christian's biblical explanation, exploration of receiving the gifts. Space is filling up, so plan to arrive early. The next council meeting is Saturday, May 4th at 9 a.m. Council members, if you have not done so, please send your reports to the office by Wednesday, April 24th. The NOW Ministries will meet Saturday, May 4th to create their ministry plans for the coming year. This special workshop will take place from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. in room 204 of the multi-purpose building. Sunday school is back. Children's ages 5 to 12 years old are invited to join Miss Deborah Mitchell from 9.30 a.m. till 10.30 a.m. in Johnson Chapel starting today. L.L. White Hall will be available for parents during the Sunday school hour. Gear up for Mother's Day, May 12, 2024. Give thanks for mothers, grandmothers, godmothers, bonus mothers, and mother figures. Come to the church prepared to nominate yourself, a friend, or a family member for recognition by the Holman United Women in Faith. Categories are detailed in the worship bulletin. 
It's not too late to take the Holman survey, scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin, or pick up a hard copy at the rear of the sanctuary or in Whitehall and complete your survey today. Please connect with us as we gather for dynamic worship, grow through inspired learning, and go into joyful service to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your continued partnership in ministry. God bless you. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest with you, rule and abide with you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.